From bloated and tired to free and inspired, welcome to Free and Inspired Radio with Philip Watkins, your weekly dose of everything digestion and mental health related. We hope you enjoy this episode. Here is your host, Philip Watkins. Yes, yes. Hi there. Welcome to another episode of Free and Inspired Radio. I'm your host, a naturopathic practitioner, Philip Watkins, and I'm grateful to have you with us today. If you're new to the show, well, the title says it all. It's all about feeling free and inspired and exploring the many different avenues you can take to get there, whether it's deep dives on digestion and mental health solutions or guests who offer their own stories and answers. I hope I can be the type of guide you can rely on to unlock the agency you have to reach your own mental and physical competency. Let's get started with what's coming up on today's episode. Coming up on this week's show. In this episode, we're going to talk all things antibiotics. You've had to take some, now what to do next? Probiotics, prebiotics, or a combination of both, it always seems that they can all help reduce the side effects of using antibiotics in their own unique way. Probiotics can help with some of the acute symptoms of antibiotic use, such as antibiotic-associated diarrhea, especially in children. Prebiotics in the form of dietary fiber can help rejuvenate the diversity of the microbial environment, so that's your bacterial environment, or how many different species that you have in your microbiome, and combining the two may improve your natural resistance or immunity to some of these opportunistic microbes that can take advantage of a suppressed immune system. Now, moving forward, we're going to have a look at a more detailed look of how to handle things post antibiotics in this episode. So I do hope you get something out of this. Okay, so whether we like it or not, sometimes an antibiotic prescription is unavoidable. And for most, it's when you've got an infection that just isn't getting better. We can start off with some normal symptoms, but then really it'll just go for a long time. And that's really where we need some form of intervention. Let's just consider a bit of a scenario here. It's the middle of the night and you're awake with that familiar feeling in your stomach. The risk that you took during dim sum, most of the time for me, the dim sum last night has not paid off, especially when it comes to chicken's feet. Yeah, there's a secret about me you didn't know. There is no choice but to re- retreat to the toilet as quietly as possible and try not to wake anyone in the house up. You've graciously received what I call a Hong Kong blessing, uh, more commonly known as food poisoning. Now, for most, the symptoms last for 24 hours. You'll have some loose bowels and maybe even some vomiting. Uh, sudden, sharp, but short, really. It, you should get over it pretty quickly and get on with it and kind of feel maybe a little better afterwards. Some people tend to feel that they uh, do feel like their energy goes up after uh, short infections like that, which is a, an interesting detail. This time, though, things don't really seem to be getting better, and that's where things start to change. The day off from work hasn't solved anything. The old out-of-date probiotics in the fridge didn't work, and even the Google doctor, the Dr. Google recommendations you seek aren't helping either. Salmonella infections, urinary tract infections, sinus infections, and lower respiratory tract infections such as bronchitis all generally require antibiotic intervention, especially if they're, if they're getting worse. And after the trip to the outpatient clinic at your closest hospital, your current Hong Kong blessing sometimes needs intervention too, or it seems to at this point. So now that you've realized you need antibiotics and you're on your way to the doctor, what explains that feeling of dread after receiving a prescription that you know will actually help you feel better? It's kind of almost counterintuitive that someone's given you something that makes you feel better, but then I know there's this uh, fear of dread that I often see in myself as well as other people. The answer is that sometimes antibiotic treatment can actually cause more harm than good. Studies show that the impact of antibiotic use varies from decreased bacterial diversity or lower numbers of species uh, recover post-treatment to opening the door to opportunistic bacteria that we mentioned earlier that can outgrow our normal bacteria, affecting the microbiome or the bacterial environment as a whole. So basically what you're doing is you're changing the members of your society in quite a massive way. 
The side effects can be quite slightly acute and sudden with, uh, from antibiotic use, with some people experiencing allergic reactions to antibiotic administration. Uh, some symptoms such as anaphylaxis in some people, so penicillin allergies is a good example. Hives and trouble breathing can occur within one to two hours of taking the initial dose. So if you are allergic, it's going to happen relatively quickly, although, interestingly, allergic symptoms can present after a more extended period of time, around four to five days after the first dose. In some cases, the symptoms may not be an allergy at all. For example, the morbophilum form skin rash, which can develop within five and 14 days of antibiotic treatment, can actually be caused by an interaction with viral infections, would you believe, such as Epstein-Barr virus or infectious mononucleosis, you know, commonly, uh, um, you know, glandular fever type of viruses, which can actually easily be misdiagnosed as an allergy. So it's worth just getting yourself checked out by an expert if you are a little unsure as to why some of these symptoms might be occurring so late after your antibiotic treatment. So look, I feel like I'm not painting the best picture here, but wait, things do get a little bit more concerning Antibiotic resistance is a very severe problem and I'd like to just kind of outline just how severe it is, not to concern you but maybe just to help you understand where we're at currently. So to properly define antibiotic resistance, the World Health Organization or WHO, we're all very now familiar with, uh, declares antibiotic resistance to be one of the top 10 global public health threats facing humanity. And that hasn't changed actually uh, with COVID and things like that. So it's still one of the biggest threats uh, facing human beings, mainly because of the antibiotic resistance. Now, a UK report called the O'Neill Report released in, uh, I think, around about uh, 10 years ago or five to 10 years ago, please fact check me on that, um, defined this by predicting that by 2050, so that's your children, my child, or grandchildren in their 30s, antibiotic resistance will potentially, or resistant infections will potentially claim 10 million lives a year, overtaking cancer, which is currently at 8.2 million lives a year. So let me repeat that. By 2050, antibiotic resistant infections will potentially claim 10 million lives a year, overtaking cancer, which is 8.2 million lives a year. Estimates from the CDC in the US suggest that over 70% of the bacteria responsible for the 2 million infections acquired in US hospitals are resistant to at least one commonly used antibiotic which is out of control. We all know about antibiotic resistance. We all know about antibiotic resistant infections and their, you know, the concern around them. But hopefully that gives you a sense of exactly how these unintended outcomes are, uh, are you know, progressing and just how serious the reality of them are. So look, a lot of these unintended outcomes, as I mentioned, compound when antibiotics are actually incorrectly prescribed or not taken properly. And this is an important point when it comes to antibiotics. We often kind of say, well, you know, I've been prescribed antibiotics and it's often on the practitioner's side that they're doing the wrong thing. But it's very, very common that patients actually don't take the uh, correct dose or the correct duration of antibiotics actually compounding the problem. Numerous studies actually show inappropriate prescriptions of antibiotics from primary care practice reaching up to 50% in the US and similar levels across Hong Kong where I am. This incorrect use of antibiotics just isn't just on the side of the prescribers. As I mentioned, an investigation into the knowledge, attitudes and behavior towards antibiotics in Hong Kong showed that 30% of the public would expect or request antibiotic prescriptions for upper respiratory tract infections such as the common cold, but 40% would not actually finish the whole course. This is what I was referring to where it's kind of a takes two to tango type of affair where both parties, both the person prescribing and the person being prescribed to have a responsibility to, you know, kind of play the game or at least uh, adhere to some of the guidelines. Now, this behavior actually, or not finishing the antibiotic course, significantly amplifies the long-term damage that antibiotics can cause. So let me repeat that. Not finishing the whole course of your antibiotics significantly amplifies the long-term damage that the antibiotics can cause. Self-medication on the side of the patient can also be a problem. 
And in a survey in Hong Kong medical practitioners in 2019, up to 83% of those interviewed, which is just over a 1,000 people, felt as if self-medication of antibiotics is an essential driver of antibiotic resistance. WHO echoes this narrative as well, especially as it seems in the Southeast Asian region. Now, it's not all bad. I've painted a pretty intense picture here, but antibiotics have saved countless lives. And before the break, I just want to look at exactly what that means. One, antibiotics have definitely saved your life if you're an adult, and at some stage, they probably will again. To contextualize this further, before the break, 80% of staph infections ended up being fatal before antibiotics. 80%. Human life expectancy between 1944 and 1972 increased by eight years, an increase largely attributed to antibiotics. Now, let me contextualize that for you. Eight years between 1944 and 1972, an increase largely attributed to antibiotics. If we were to cure cancer, we would generally only get three to four years added on our life expectancy. So that's been doubled by the use of antibiotics. So whilst, you know, as I said, there are some you know, uh, interesting public uh, you know, ideas and you know, opinions and perspectives around the use of antibiotics, and some of them are well-founded as we've gone through here, to be fair, the end of the Second you know, World War might not have helped, but it is challenging to disagree about the powerful effects that antibiotics have had on medicine in general. After the break, we're going to actually start to talk about what we can do once you've had that antibiotic course. So you've been through your seven days, you've taken your two a day, and you've done everything that you've been asked to do. What do you do next? We'll be talking more about that after the break. Woo! Time to take a break. Are you enjoying this episode of Free and Inspired Radio? There's no better time to take back your personal health sovereignty. If you want to connect with more free and inspired episodes, simply subscribe to your favorite podcast platform or visit the website at www.philipwatkins.health for more information. Let's get back to the show. Welcome back to Free and Inspired Radio. I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. In this episode, we're talking all things antibiotics, what to do when you've taken them, maybe some background about how we've got to worry about them so much, but more so how to help your body recover post-taking antibiotics. So look, one of the first things that you can do, as we talked about just a little bit before the break, is actually to take the entire course prescribed. Not doing so actually contributes to antibiotics resistance, but worse still, you may not actually get better. Now, this is something that's really, really common. Antibiotics can actually find it challenging to reach some regions of the body, such as the sinuses more than others. Uh, This difficulty can actually result in longer courses recommended and this is where in some cases people can get a little frustrated in the sense that they have to take multiple rounds of antibiotics but it's actually because as I mentioned those antibiotics have trouble finding where they need to be or getting to where they need to be sorry in relation to you know what they're trying to treat. So not completing the prescription in the first place can actually result in the infection not being adequately treated most often leading to another course of antibiotics on top of the fact that it can take time for these infections to clear. Now, certain probiotic species, uh, such as Saccharomyces boulardii, can help with the acute side effects of antibiotic use, like antibiotic-associated diarrhea, which happens quite a lot in children. Antibiotic-associated diarrhea, or AAD, can present differently depending on the type of antibiotic you've actually used. Sometimes it can occur earlier, perhaps during the course or unknown to most after actually a delayed response. It can be very, very uncomfortable. And as I mentioned, it affects children regularly. Now, this lesser known of species of probiotic can help and it's called Saccharomyces boulardii, one of the darlings of natural medicine. I'm sure if you're a practitioner listening to this, you know a lot about S. boulardii. But what 
if you haven't heard of it. Well, this form of probiotic is a little different from the rest. It's, what common, it's what's commonly referred to as a beneficial yeast. Now, when I say beneficial yeast to people, they often get a little worried because of things like candida overgrowth. But Espelati has 10 controlled trials, which I can guarantee you is very, very good on preventing antibiotic-associated diarrhea, where eight of the 10 trials showed significant effectiveness in preventing AAD, which is fantastic for kids who get a lot of these kind of symptoms once again. Of these eight trials, Espelati was given concomitantly with antibiotics for up to seven weeks post the dose to capture that delayed onset of symptoms, showing very consistent results across the board. Probiotics can actually also help build resilience towards some of these opportunistic bacteria and yeast that can develop after antibiotic use. Antibiotics increase the risk of opportunistic infections from other bacteria, but early early animal studies also uh, show increased opportunistic viral infections after antibiotic use, like the flu. In some cases, the infections that develop are resistant to antibiotics, causing further problems. So this is a really big thing, and sometimes this is where probiotics may actually really help in the sense that they might not be actually helping you recover so much, but maybe just more protecting your immune system, which is really, really important. Together with this, articles going back as far as 1966, uh, a very great year if you're an English football fan, highlight the mechanisms by which antibiotics increase our naturally occurring amounts of undesirable yeast, such as candida albicans, which you may be familiar with. In other cases, antibiotic use decreases microbial diversity by up to 25%. That's huge. Imagine you live in a town where all of a sudden the types of people living in your town decrease by 25% off one dose. This decrease can lead to what's called intestinal dysbiosis or more commonly known as leaky gut. Enter our probiotic species that build that resilience. If you're new to what a probiotic is, here is the definition as a reminder. Probiotics are live microorganisms that confer a health benefit on the host when administered in adequate amounts. Uh, One way that probiotics help help protect us from overgrowth of candida albicans and other opportunistic bacteria is their ability to create something called bacteriosins. Lactobacillus or lactobacilli species, which you may have heard of before, are especially good at this. Bacteriosins produced by bacteria have a lethal effect on many different classes of bacteria, including the ones that happen to form when the opportunity arises, such as uh, Staphylococcus aureus, which is a big one for acne if you want to to know it's not just lactobacilli species that help with this but your bifidobacterium too so maybe some of these species that you're starting to see on the back of your probiotic label are starting to make some sense now the bifidobacteria are particularly good at blocking bacteria setting up shop in your digestion when it gets there sometimes or something referred to as colonization or adhesion Now, in practical terms, your probiotics should have a good spread of lactobacilli and bifidobacteria and be kept in the fridge. Remember, part of how we identify probiotics is that they are alive and cold cold temperatures, mostly below 24 degrees, keep probiotics living. Always choose brands that need to be refrigerated. I really would stress that, especially if you live in more equatorial cities like I do, such as Hong Kong or Singapore, where it can be a little warmer. As well as that, you also need to consider the transport uh, of those as well. So they also need to be transported in cooler uh, places. Another critical tip around probiotics and concomitant use with antibiotics is to make sure that you separate the doses of both by a minimum of two hours. So separating your antibiotic dose with your probiotic dose by about two hours is very, very important. Once again, in more practical terms, this would just mean taking your antibiotic doses at breakfast and dinner as you've been instructed with the probiotic after lunch, which I know for some people can be a little difficult when it comes to work and things like that, but just give it a try and see how you go. So let's move forward a little bit. Are there dietary choices that can help boost recovery from antibiotics? Well, the answer is yes. More precisely, though, it's a combination of what you eat and what you don't eat. So it's probably more of a common answer than most. Let's focus on what to eat first because that's always a big question that I get in the clinic. Prebiotics in the form of dietary fiber. Let me say that again. Prebiotics in the form of dietary fiber is the first thing I'd love you to focus on if you've had uh, some form of antibiotic course. It's a simple choice, but most people 
it's actually quite difficult to achieve at optimal levels daily. And I'm talking about fiber in this case. So it's suggested that most of us should increase our fiber intake by around 50% within the Western world. And this is coming from a study that I believe was done in Norway on around about 140,000 people. That if you know me well enough, I tend to just harp on this study because it blew my mind in the 140,000 people. This is a really large cohort of people that aren't getting enough fiber and are really just showing how in the developed western world we're not really getting such an important um, form of nutrition and i'd really you know you'll you'll find that i bring this up quite a lot so hopefully uh you you remember um over the course of time to get more fiber but look this insufficient consumption is quite alarming when you place fiber into our dietary currency framework especially a form of currency the body uses to manage our weight insulin sensitivity digestive health levels of inflammation mental health and cardiovascular health and that's all got evidence behind it as well current experiments in animals suggest that a low fiber diet can actually delay recovery from commonly used antibiotics so i'll repeat that current experiments in animals suggest that a low fiber diet can delay recovery from commonly used antibiotics which means that this dietary element isn't just a fun thing and it's nice to have it's actually going to delay your ability to recover from that seven day antibiotic course so in thinking about getting diet prebiotic dietary fiber from your diet a key mantra is all prebiotics are forms of dietary fiber but not all dietary fiber is prebiotic that means that more focused dietary choices can really make quite a huge difference prebiotics in the form of dietary fiber play a critical role in the balance of the digestive system by providing the resources to create something called short chain fatty acids short chain fatty acids help maintain the digestive tract's integrity referred to as intestinal barrier integrity and decrease inflammation in the lining of the digestion significantly when looking at antibiotic recovery short chain fatty acids actually modulate the immune system and specific regions of the digestion suppressing the growth of the opportunistic bacteria and yeast that we discussed such as candida albicans so a very important part of defending your body from you know, the decrease or suppressed immunity that, that occurs with antibiotic use short chain fatty acids also promote the development of important probiotic bacterial species such as lactobacillus and bifidobacteria which we just talked about which come together to form a significant component of our microbiome so very very important soluble fiber such as inulin so they're found it is found in things like globe artichoke leeks asparagus oats and soybeans not always all soy is bad help to increase the levels of short chain fatty acids and adding these foods throughout your antibiotic course and the preceding weeks after the antibiotic course is finished can bolster the chances of your digestion finding the balance it needs post antibiotic use quickly before we finish let's talk about what you don't eat and how that makes a difference to your antibiotic recovery it's not going to be surprising for you to hear that anti oh, i'm sorry anti i hear that artificial sweeteners aren't going to help you worse still preliminary research from the university of queensland and australia suggests that commonly used artificial sweeteners such as saccharin sucralose aspartame and acephalum potassium may increase the exchange of antibiotic genes uh, between bacteria making them harder to clear in the future so look this is a really easy trap to fall into most people don't feel as if they're exposed to artificial sweeteners as much as they th as you know as much as they may be a really easy trap that a lot of people fall into is actually protein powders so have a look and see where how your protein powder is flavored a sea foam potassium may actually be popping up in that and as i said it's a very easy trap you don't think the protein powder is doing anything uh, too bad for you but this sweetener in there may actually be causing some issues if you're taking it along with your antibiotics in 2018 a cover a study covering the same sweeteners mentioned above that they're well, mentioned just before found that their effect on the bacteria in the digestive system to be toxic in nature it's not often that a study uses the term toxic so they do tend to use that term for a reason and it's not something you want to be doing when the digestive system is already trying to recover from something else i.e 
taking some antibiotics. So look, in summary, what do I do if I've had antibiotics and I want to improve my recovery? Well, we all get the old, old, the odd Hong Kong blessing wherever we are, uh, where food poisoning or other forms of infection leave us with no other option but to use antibiotics. They may not be a bad thing, but remember that people would die of superficial infection before antibiotics so just be grateful that medical science and medical innovation is here to save your life in that sense and if you find yourself in this situation hopefully this podcast has given you the opportunity to take a little bit more agency in relation to how you can help yourself recover from antibiotic use and here we are at the end of the episode. I hope you enjoyed this one. Once again, you can find a lot of the references to the studies that have been mentioned in this show, uh, in the show notes and a transcript of this show as well on the website of philipwatkins.health. Once again, I hope you've got something out of this episode. I'm slowly but surely feel like I'm getting better at doing these podcasts, but I'm just going to keep plugging away. So do excuse my uh, ums and ahs and all those bits and pieces where I'm making the odd mistake here. I'm just going to keep going, keep practicing, and hopefully you're getting some form of information from here. Once again, if you want any further information about myself, my clinic in Hong Kong, or my virtual clinic that's global, uh, please don't hesitate to go to philipwatkins.health. And if you really do want some more information about what's going on with philipwatkins.health, then please don't hesitate to sign up to the email list there, where we'll be sending out newsletters letting you know about a new article being released most weeks and new podcast episodes that will be released most weeks as well for now as usual i've been talking way too much have a fantastic week and we look forward to being back with you for the next episode oh my gosh you made it to the end This show is all about you, and we hope you finished this episode feeling one step closer to feeling free and inspired. We'll be back next week, but if you want to know more about Philip, please catch a digital flight to www.philipwatkins.health for further details about how we might be able to help. In the meantime, have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, and we'll see you for another episode next week.